In this video, we're going to look at the history that led us to our current understanding of motion. Imagine with me, if you will, it's the year 350 BC, and you are the first person to investigate motion. You're probably going to start with some simple, basic experiments, especially considering the time period. So let's imagine you do something like this. Now, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that if you try to push an object across the floor, it's going to come to a stop eventually. That's just something everybody knows. Well, maybe it's the sliding issue. It's a box sliding. So let's try a different experiment. So maybe something like this. All right, so you discover that if you roll something, it can go farther, but still, it'll eventually come to a stop. In fact, everything you try, the end result's pretty much always the same. When you push something or create motion, eventually it stops. So Aristotle was the figurehead of this time period for the study of motion. And he came to a conclusion and made the statement that it is the nature of every object to be at rest, unless push or pulled. This seems like a perfectly logical conclusion, so it became the definitive statement regarding motion for the next 2,000 years. In roughly the 1600s, a man named Galileo Galilei began his own study of motion, and he became the first man in 2,000 years to question Aristotle's conclusion. After careful consideration, he decided that this actually doesn't make sense. So Galileo started to imagine a little bit beyond what Aristotle did. And I like to think he imagined something like this. What if we repeat our box experiment, but this time we try it on some really smooth ice? In that case, course, your experience is going to tell you that the box is going to go a lot further. So Galileo started imagining, well, what would happen if you had such smooth ice, or in other words, you could get rid of all friction and e even get rid of air resistance, well, would the box ever stop? He concluded that no, it wouldn't. So Galileo came up with his own conclusion on motion. An object will keep moving unless a force brings it to a stop. He also introduced the concept of inertia, which we can define as an object's resistance to change in motion. So together this developed into what's known as the law of inertia. The key here is the idea of change. So basically what the law of inertia says is that objects are going to do whatever they want unless they're forced to change. I know a lot of humans who act similar to that. So here's an application today. All right, it's something we've all done. But have you ever asked yourself the question, why did a slow, steady pull cause the paper to roll out easily, but a quick tug ripped the paper off? Do me a favor, take 10 seconds and try to answer that question for yourself. Well, in some ways, you can answer that with just inertia, but let's go into it in more detail than that. So remember, the issue with inertia is that it's a resistance to change in motion. The slow, steady roll is a relatively small change in the motion of the toilet paper, so there wasn't much resistance to it. The large tug would have required a large change in the motion of the toilet paper, 
So there was a lot of resistance and it turned into more than the paper could handle. And so it ripped off. Now, we're gonna get into some other more advanced topics a little later, but to give you a little preview, you could also explain this in terms of force and acceleration. So acceleration is essentially the change in motion of an object. So if you have a small acceleration like the slow pull, you need a small force to make that happen. But if you want a large acceleration like the quick tug, you're gonna need a large force and then suddenly the toilet paper becomes too weak to handle that large force and it tears off. The same year that Galileo passed away, Isaac Newton was born. During Isaac Newton's life, he formalized some of the work by Galileo, and today we know it as Newton's first law of motion. So this is the more modern version, even though this was a long time ago, this is more of our modern version of what we call the law of inertia. So in this case, we have an object at rest remains at rest, or an object in motion travels at a uniform speed in a straight line, unless acted on by a non-zero net force. This concept of a net force we'll actually go over later in the video. You can see that it's more complicated than Galileo's version. And Newton in introduced this concept of uniform speed and straight line motion. Right. Well, again, let's go back and just as a reminder, the whole, the key to all of this is change. So if the motion's not gonna change, then there's really only two options. It's gonna travel at its speed, a constant speed, and it's gotta go in a straight line. Anything else would be a change or it could simply be at rest. So I found this cool video on YouTube. There's a link to it. We're just gonna sample um, just a portion of it. I can feel the air jets now coming out of here and I'm gonna put the glider on top and it's hovering on top of the air. So it's almost frictionless. And let's send it down to the far end where there's an elastic band. Now, you may have well seen this sort of thing before, of course, if you've ever played air hockey with those little pucks. Okay, let's stop it there. We do have an air track like this at SUU, and I could have made a video, but I don't have a cool accent like that, so I thought this would be more interesting for you. In this case, the air track gives about, of, uh, about as good of an example of non-frictionless or no friction uh, motion that you can find. So it's interesting to see how a little push, that track just kept gliding, and if it gave it enough time, it would have kept going, going, and eventually, it does have some resistance to the air and it would have stopped, but this is a good demonstration of what Galileo was trying to imagine. Okay, so at this point we need to start defining certain terms and we should start with the concept of a force. So ask yourself, what is a force? How would you define it? We don't need a complicated definition for every term, so let's just define it as simply a push or a pull. Obviously, the strength of the push, how hard you're pushing or pulling, is important. But what about the direction of the force? Is that important? Well, here's a little thought experiment to maybe demonstrate my point. Imagine you're standing at the edge of the cliff and you have a friend standing behind you. That friend is going to apply a force on you whether you want it or not. You can either have the force applied forward or you can have it applied backward. I think you can agree with me that in this situation, direction is very important. And it turns out that in every situation, 
the direction of the force is important and something that we have to track. Because direction is important for a force, all forces are vectors. If you've never heard of a vector before, a vector is any quantity that describes how much of something and in what direction that something is applied. The how much is often referred to as a magnitude. So in terms of a force, the magnitude would be the strength of the force. Here's a good way to remember the definition of vector. Go by the name of vector. It's a mathematical term, a quantity represented by an arrow with both direction and magnitude. Vector! That's me, because I'm committing crimes with both direction and magnitude. Oh yeah! All right, I obviously have kids and I love that section, so. Okay, so how do we deal with vectors? Vectors can be represented as arrows. The length of the arrow describes the magnitude. That's the how much. The direction is, well, obvious, it's the direction. So here I would be representing four different vectors. If they were forces, the directions are obviously showing where they're going, and then the length would show you which one's stronger or weaker. So clearly this is the strongest, that would be the weakest. Let's look at specific force vectors. Just a heads up, um, we're gonna discuss a lot of vector quantities in this class. Things like velocity, acceleration, those are all vectors. For now, let's just focus on forces. But the nice thing is a lot of the properties we're gonna learn today are gonna apply to um, those, those types of quantities later on. So let's look at two different forces here. The top vector is half the length of the bottom. So what you'd say is it's half the strength. In this case, the top one is three times longer than the bottom, so it should be three times stronger, but it's also in the opposite direction. In science, whenever you're measuring a quantity, turns out that there's an international standard for the units that you should use. These are called SI units. Now why it's SI and not IS is because it's a French uh, abbreviation. In any case, distance, whenever you're measuring a, a length, some kind of distance, the, the standard is meters, time is seconds, and mass is in kilograms. Now, it doesn't mean you have to measure these things, but when you report those values, it's generally considered um, standard procedure to use these values. So what would that be for force? In SI units, it's a Newton. It's abbreviated with a capital N in our case. You may have never heard of a Newton before as far as a, a measurement of force, and so there, it's probably not going to be too familiar for you, but Hopefully this will help. So to give you an idea of scale, one Newton is only about 20% of a pound. So 0.225 pounds. So what that, what that means is if you had 100 Newtons, that would be about 22 pounds. If you had 10 Newtons, that'd be a little over two pounds. All right, so let's look at two of our force vectors from the previous problem. So this, these were the two that were, one was three times longer than the other. So we could represent that as three newtons and nine newtons. It's important to understand though that this length doesn't actually mean anything in terms of distance. So it's a relative comparison. This length only means something if you can compare it to something else. So in this case, if this is three, then this would have to be nine because it's three times as long. But you could easily represent this kind of force. Notice I can use the same length with respect to 50, which would make this one 150. So it's not a physical distance that we care about, it's, it's a relative or comparative distance. 
So imagine we have a box with two forces acting on it. How we draw force vectors as they act on objects is you put the tail of the vector on the object. And then of course the direction shows which way that force is acting. So imagine you had a force pushing down on this box. It's actually incorrect to draw the vector like that. You wouldn't ever want to see a force vector drawn like that. The correct way would be, as I mentioned before, you put the tail on the object. And what this means is that push and pull really aren't defined in terms of our vector notation because it actually doesn't matter whether you're pushing or pulling. All you care about is the result of the force. So let's stick with just one dimension for now. When you have multiple forces acting on an object, the quantity that you mostly care about isn't either of those individual forces, it's something called a net force. That is the vector sum of two or more forces. And when I say vector sum, vector addition is noticeably more complicated than regular addition. We're gonna just cover the basics of it, not get into it too much. So in this example, how we calculate the net force is we add the two values together. But remember, forces are vectors and vectors require a strength or a magnitude and direction. So in this example, this is the strength or magnitude of that vector. And this would be the mathematical representation of the direction. Over here, the nine newtons would be what we call the magnitude, and then the direction would be the positive, or lack of negative implies a positive. So we're adding the two vectors together and including direction in our addition. So this is an example of one-dimensional vector addition. The reason why we chose positive and negative is just kind of an arbitrary choice. It's just a standard convention. It's typical to say left is negative direction and right is positive direction. We'll go ahead and assume that throughout our semester, but just keep in mind, you actually don't have to do that as long as everybody agrees on what you're doing. So if we do that math now, it becomes easy. You just get positive six newtons. And again, the positive is actually important. It implies the positive direction. So the other way we would write that is six newtons to the right. From the box's perspective, it doesn't actually care that there's two forces. The only thing it cares about is the net force. The net force is what defines how the motion is gonna uh, proceed for that object. So from the box's perspective, it just has one force, the net force, which is six newtons. All right, let's try a little bit different example. In this case, I've swapped the direction and change some of the values. So just to show you the process again, so we're adding the two vectors, but we're considering the directions as well. So we're gonna say left is negative. In this case, we end up with a negative three newtons, which is just telling us that it's three newtons of force to the left. So from the box's perspective, it's just three newtons left. You can use this kind of notation for any one dimensional application. So what if we go up and down? The convention is up is positive, down is negative. So in this case, nine newtons plus negative six. Again, we're adding, including direction. So we end up with a positive three, which implies three newtons upward. So that's the whole perspective from the box as far as the reaction that it's gonna to have to that force and the change in its motion. So one dimension is pretty straightforward. Most people don't have too big a difficulty with the, the positive and negative sign. When you get to two or more dimensions, it does start to get more complicated. So in that case, you do something like this. This is called addition, uh, in the symbolic case anyway, this is called addition by tip to tail method. This is the notation that you would use for full vector addition. 
Now, it does get complicated, and so we're actually just not going to worry about two-dimension or three-dimension vector addition in this class. We'll just stick with the one-dimension case. What if you had this situation? What do you think the net force would be? Why don't you take a second and try to figure it out? Well, we don't do anything different. We just add the two together, but since one is to the left, we'll give it a negative sign, and we end up with a zero for our answer. So our conclusion is that there's just simply no net force. There's no direction for a zero value, so there's just no net force. This kind of situation is called equilibrium, when all the forces balance out. As another example, if we had three vectors, nothing changes. We just add another term in our addition. So all we've done is added. So if we had 10 vectors, then you would see 10 terms, assuming this was uh, it was all in one dimension. In this specific example, they still add up to be zero. So you would still call this equilibrium. So let's go ahead and define equilibrium. It's defined as when the net force on an object is zero. This is the summation symbol. So if we add all the forces, that's what this is saying, and they equal zero, then that's called equilibrium. So let's practice this a little bit. I'm gonna pause here, read the question, and choose the best answer. Like I've said earlier, please play along with me during these videos. It's going to make it much less boring. Okay, the key to this problem is one word, it's rest. If an object's at rest, it can't have any combined push or pull so that it's moving in one direction. So that has to be a case of equilibrium. We know in equilibrium that the net force is zero, or in other words, if you add all the forces together, you get zero. So this answer is pretty straightforward, it's zero. This is a good point to introduce a specific type of force, support force. So if a support force is simply any force that supports some or all of the weight of another object. In this case, the box is being supported by the table, so there's gotta be a support force there. There's just one. So let's switch that question up a little bit and ask about the support force. What is the support force on the box if the weight is 25 newtons? It's 25 newtons up. The weight is pulling the box down. You can think of weight as the force of gravity in this specific example. So we know that's gonna be pulling it down, but we also know that it's at rest, so all the forces have to add to zero. There's only one force because it's only interacting with one object. So to get a net force of zero, the, force has, the support force has to be opposite, but equal in magnitude, so it's gonna be up. Remember, this would be the magnitude of the force, this would be the direction. Okay, a few more examples. Imagine a car traveling on a long straight road at a constant speed. The car's engine is producing a thousand newtons of force between the car's tires and the road. What is the net force on the car? Take a few seconds and come to your own conclusion. <laughs> 
The answer is zero in this case. If the net force is zero, then this must be a situation of equilibrium. Now, if that caught you off guard, please pay attention to this explanation. Equilibrium is when the net force is zero. It was never defined as an object being at rest. So think about what's happening in this case. The car is traveling on a straight road, so it's just one direction. It's not changing, that's what's being implied. And it's traveling at a constant speed, so again, it has motion, but the motion isn't changing. That's what we mean by constant speed. So if it's not changing direction or speed, there's no change in motion, so that must be equilibrium. So the only option is a net force of zero. So keep that in mind. Equilibrium isn't just things that are at rest. It's anything whose motion is not changing. Rest is just a special case of that. Let's switch this question up just a little bit and ask, what would the total resistive force from friction and air resistance be in this situation? Hopefully you got this one right. It would be a thousand newtons in the backward direction. So the car's engine would be pushing it forward, but we just uh, decided that it was in equilibrium. So the resistive force should be equal, but opposite that. So that would be in the backwards direction. All right, last question. An object in equilibrium has a net force of zero. In this state, what is the motion of the object? When I ask this on quizzes, the common answer, well, not the common answer, but an answer I see quite a bit is C, but keep in mind, as we just discussed in the previous um, question, equilibrium is when there's no net force, as it states up there. It doesn't say anything about motion. So you can be at rest or you can be moving in a constant speed or in a constant direction. You just can't change. So in this case, the best answer would be E. That's it for our introduction to motion. This is an overview of chapter two from our textbook. In the next section, we'll still continue discussing motion. We'll just get more into the specifics and the, the specific terms that describe motion.